I went to Billy's house. You went to Billy's house? Daniel, you know that's all the way at the end of the block. That's off limits for you. I'm sorry, Mom. Okay. All right, well, because you're sorry, I'm not gonna punish you this time, okay? I'm going out and play. Oh, what, Daniel? I needed a pen, so I got it in your purse, Mom. My purse? Daniel, you know you're not supposed to get in my purse. But because you confessed, I'm not going to do anything about it this time. Okay? Thanks, Mom. What is it, Daniel? I took a soda from the refrigerator and drank it. A soda? Daniel, you, you know you have to ask before you get in the refrigerator. I'm sorry, Mom. I won't ever do it again. Well, okay. Since you'll never do it again, then this time I won't punish you. I'll let it go. Thanks, Mom. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to be joined by our class members. And by now, you certainly are probably as familiar with them as you are with our teaching and with both Emory and I. In this particular lesson, we're going to be talking about the relational elements associated with biblical discipline. And Emory, that scenario we just saw, now that could be uh, a very positive thing for moms and dads when you have a child coming up and openly sharing with them some of the things that they've done wrong or that could be a very frightening thing for parents. That could be a warning to them. Right. And that's part of what you're going to learn tonight. What does true repentance look like? We're going to be back in just a few moments to talk about that and a number of other relational issues associated with true biblical discipline. Be back in a moment. And welcome again to another session of Growing Kids God's Way. In this particular session, we're going to be talking about repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. Now, these are the relational elements that's associated with biblical discipline. First of all, the place to begin is let's talk about what the scriptures have to say about repentance. And I'm going to draw from the words of the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world only produces death. Ladies and gentlemen, without repentance, there is no turning from sin. Without forgiveness, there can be no restoration of a broken relationship that resulted from a sinful action. That's why these components are so important in the child training process. Right now, I want to talk to you about the word regret, because so often the word regret is substituted for the concept of repentance. Regret and repentance are not the same thing. Uh, you cannot repent without regret, but you can regret without repentance. This is an important distinction. Many children regret their actions. We in an adult state, we regret our actions, but that regret does not necessarily drive us to godly repentance. We may regret our actions because we were caught. We may regret our actions because we were embarrassed. So often that's why children regret their actions, maybe because they lost something. I think of the little guy who had a brand new ball that he was kicking in the air, and his mom went out and not only warned him, but directed him to move away from the back fence don't kick that ball in the air near the fence and he disregarded his mom's advice after she went in the house kicked the ball up in the air over the fence and it went and it fell into the wash and started to be washed down with the water that was flowing there 
Now, in that moment, the young man regretted his actions, but it was not a godly regret. It was not unto repentance. He, didn't, he wasn't repentive that he violated his mom's instruction, did not heed to her wisdom. He only regretted because he lost his ball. That's why he regretted. That is not godly repentance. But so often, moms, more you than dads, so often what you will do is you'll go out, honey, you lost your ball. That is too, ball, too bad. And you will speak and we'll go out and get you a new ball. But you've missed a prime teaching time, teaching your child the importance of obeying mom. But the real issue of repentance that comes with understanding there's been a violation of our fellowship. Let's continue on. That's regret. We have to understand that the doctrine of repentance must be understood in the context of relationships. That's what this little guy didn't understand. He didn't care about the fact that he did not obey his mom. He just wanted his ball back. But the doctrine of repentance must be understood in the context of relationships. In fact, the object of repentance is not the sin itself, but the effect sin had on the relationship. This is so important for you to understand in the parenting process when correcting your child. The Christian relationship with the Lord is a perfect example of this. When we sin against the Lord individually, personally, the object of our sin is not just what we did, but there's a greater object, our broken relationship with God. We no longer have perfect fellowship with the Lord. Now, we know that we are to restore with the Lord. We understand the concept of, of confession. We know that we can be brought back through confession with the Lord and be put back in a right relationship as we confess and, and truly repent. But the same process is true with our children. Our children need to understand and learn that the object of repentance, when we talk about their sin, it's not just the sin. So often in evangelicalism, what we will say is, you need to repent over your sin. Well, what does that look like? What does that really mean? You mean I need to feel repentive over what I did? More than that, you need to feel repentive, not only what you did, but what you did and how it affected our relationship or the relationship with someone else. So repentance is very closely tied to relationships. Now with young children, let me qualify this. Because you, you can't be going to your two-year-old, Dwayne, and saying, now look, honey, you need to repent. Your two-year-olds and your three-year-olds uh, do not understand repentance. Uh, the only thing they understand is the consequence of your correction. They may regret what they did because your correction is sufficient to bring about regret. But in terms of true repentance, they're not there yet. That's going to take time. Look, moms and dads, that's why teaching is so important teaching this doctrine of repentance. You have to transition your child from the natural regret that comes because, in fact, they have violated your instructions, you have brought consequences into their life, and they don't like it. Transition from that regret to the concept of repentance directed towards relationship. We need to restore relationships. So you have some age considerations. Let me just suggest that the most ideal state of repentance for children over four years of age is re relational repentance. That's where you're headed. But again, understand that children under four years of age, there's a lot of regret. And that regret eventually must move to repentance. So don't go out and try to win your, your three-year-olds to, to repentance because it's not going to happen. But you, you need to move them in that direction. You need to help them understand how their wrong behavior has affected your fellowship with them. Now, fellowship, that really is a key word. You need to jot this down. Fellowship is a key word, moms and dads. You see, when your children do something that they should not be doing when they disobeyed you? In truth, it's the fellowship that is broken, isn't it? Listen, not the relationship. You see, when we sin against the Lord, our relationship isn't altered. He doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't stop demonstrating his grace to us. He doesn't stop caring for us. Our relationship is still the same. We still cry out, Abba, Father. We still have that parent-child relationship. But what changes is the fellowship. So the same thing is true with our children. You need to bring them to the point of understanding. Mommy and Daddy will never stop loving you. Uh, no matter what you do, we will still show you the love that we have in our hearts for you. 
But we all want you to understand that there will be times when you do things that will hurt us in such a way that, that the joy of being together as a family and as being together as, as a mom and dad or, or the joy between you and your siblings, sin robs each other of that joy. See, when you sin, it's not just against the Lord. When you sin against a brother or sister, you're stealing from them the joy of you being that brother, the joy of you being that sister. This is all part of it. Now, let's move on here. Getting repentance is not enough. Every parent wants to bring the children to repentance in time. As the children grow older, you'll be able to demonstrate this, talk about the relational side. But we need to help our children rightly restore broken relationships that sin created. So let's talk about restoration. What does restoring do? Restoring the relationship closes the offense and buries it. It closes the offense and buries it. Without restoration, relationships continue in a state of war. I know, ladies and gentlemen, I know that there is a high probability that you have someone in your life that has affected you, that has sinned against you, that years have passed, but you really have never restored the relationship. It could be a parent. It could be a friend. It could be an old school, ch school child. It could be a brother or a sister. But there's, or it could even be a child, actually, that you have never rightly restored. You are in an ongoing state of war. You know why that happens? Because no one has ever either taught you or taught them the importance of restoring in order to close off the offense and bury it, get rid of it once and for all. You can't do it simply by turning your back, walking away, and not dealing rightly with it as the Bible speaks about it. So what we need to do is we need to bring... We need to bring closure by restoration, and restoration needs to be done in the right way. I remember the time, honey, I know you remember this, when, well, we were teaching at a school. Actually, I was the, more or less the pastoral administrator of the school, and I had to dismiss a young man from school from Thursday to Tuesday, four days dismissal. And, of course, there's a little bit of tension because his parents were like the founding family of the church. But they were very supportive. I called the dad, said, you need to come down and get little Willie and... and and he needs to go home, and I explained, and everything was fine. Now, we all went to the same church on Sunday, so we're going to be right in the middle of, of this uh, suspension on, on Sunday meeting time. And we walked in, we took our seats in the in church, which was usually in the back left side, and they sat in the front right-hand corner of the church. And I saw the mom was with the, was with the son that I suspended, was with Willie, and you could see her talking to him. And apparently there was a little bit of conflict because I saw her take his ear and lift him up out of the pew. And they got up and they came around front and I can see they're coming down to us. And so the mom brought little Willie down and, and said, Willie, do you need to say something to Mr. Ezzo? And now Amory and I are sitting there with our kids and Willie says, I'm sorry. No, Willie, you need to say it better than that. I'm sorry. No, I want to hear better. I'm sorry, say Mr. Ezzo, Mr. Ezzo, there, there, she said, just like that, there, there, now this is all fixed, you've got two more days at home, but this is all fixed, and we want to make it right, I'm so sorry, she said, that he did those things, and she went on, ladies and gentlemen, it was not fixed, it was not fixed, there was no restoration, and the reason there was no restoration is because the young man never came through the doorway of forgiveness, there is a doorway, let's talk about it. Forgiveness. Repentance begins with the offender. See, if you offend someone, I can't make you repentant. Only you could be repentant. So it begins with you. It begins with the offender. But forgiveness begins with the person offended. It has to start with me. It has to start with my attitude, being ready to, to forgive you. So understand that repentance begins with the offender. Forgiveness begins with the person offended. Now, this is a great theological truth. Please understand. Forgiveness is the process which requires agreement between two parties. Forgiveness is the process which requires agreement between two parties. You know, the entire gospel message is based on this great truth. You see, Jesus Christ whose sacrifice on the cross, which is totally sufficient for all of mankind, that shedding of his blood 
paid the complete penalty that will allow the repentant sinner to enter the presence of God. That is, of course, done by faith. Now, Christ's crucifixion, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, is sufficient. He offers forgiveness to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. All right? Will everyone enter the kingdom of God? No. Why not? Because although forgiveness is offered, it must be received. Understand that. You can stand, ladies and gentlemen, and forgive that person in your life, that mother, that father that walked out on you, that, that girlfriend that mistreated you, or that boyfriend, whatever it may be. You can forgive that person. But if that person is not willing to accept your forgiveness, you're still in a state of war. That's what you're in. You're in a state of war. And it's right for you to offer the forgiveness, but you need to understand there's got to be agreement on, with both parties. That's why forgiveness is so important with the a, with a parent-child relationship. On one hand, you can have a child that's ready to restore, but a parent not ready to offer forgiveness, and that's wrong. On the other hand, you may have a parent that's ready to say, Honey, I, I'm going to forgive you. But what if the child doesn't want to seek forgiveness? That's why you've got to train your children to seek forgiveness. Brother, sister, they had a little, a, a little problem. You corrected it. Uh, we know that, that big brother, Wes, picked on little brother John, all right? Now, we, we dealt with Wes, and now we're going to say to Wes, Wes, you need to seek your brother's forgiveness, but John, you need to forgive your brother. Without those two, you're not going to have the final restoration. You're still going to be at war. Now, asking for forgiveness, listen to this, does not mean saying, I'm sorry. This is another key theological point. Asking for forgiveness does not mean saying, I'm sorry, or saying, I apologize. That, the apologies that we are talking about here, saying, I'm sorry, is for unintentional mistakes. If there's, if there's been a moral violation, if there's been defiance, if, if there's been violation to a, a brother or sister or someone else, then what you need to teach your children is to actually seek forgiveness. Those words. They cannot simply say, I'm sorry. Wes cannot say back to John, well, John... I'm sorry. For what does I'm sorry mean? When Wes says, I'm sorry to John, Wes is in control. Totally. He knows how sorry he is in his heart. He could be very sorrowful. It could be, I'm sorry, John. Or it could be, I'm sorry, John. You see, he's in control. To say I'm sorry, to say I apologize, that is fine when you make a mistake. But when you're dealing with malicious intent, when you have actually wronged someone, those terms are, are, are not correct. The Bible teaches us that if you're going to restore a relationship, then you must restore the relationship by seeking forgiveness. There is a great deal of difference between the two, a great deal of difference between saying, I am sorry, and will you forgive me? You see, when you say, will you forgive me, that is a very humbling thing. That, in fact, what, what that is saying is I am putting you, myself under you. I am acknowledging motive of the heart. That's the big thing. It's an acknowledgement of the motive of the heart. And here's the other thing. When I say I'm sorry, I'm in complete control. But when I say, will you forgive me, when I ask you, will you forgive me, you're now in control. Now, you have a heavenly response that you need to offer, but you have to understand when we seek forgiveness, this is very humbling. Now think about it. Maybe this last week, uh, maybe there were some words that went on between the two of you. Maybe, maybe someone didn't do their homework and, and the partner got on top of them and said, Honey, you know, we're going back to that class and, and you haven't been doing your homework and you had some words and, and you realize, well, this isn't right. And so you wanted to make it right in the, in the Christian manner. And so you turned to your, your spouse and you said, um, Okay, honey, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't do my homework. I'm, I'm sorry I said the things that I said. I'm sorry. Okay? Maybe something like that. Or maybe you were driving somewhere and, man, you didn't listen to your wife. Uh, and she said, honey, you need to turn right. No, no. You turn left. And, and then you found out you were wrong. And, uh, and then you got into words. And, and you said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. We're going to church. We need to be right. I'm sorry. Okay? Whatever the scenario was in your family this week, I want you to institute. I want you to go back. And I want you to put these words in. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, what I want you to say is, darling, would you forgive me 
for not controlling my tongue. Whoa, everything changes right there. When you humble yourself and say, would you forgive me for not being the husband I needed to be? Would you forgive me be, for being so prideful that I thought I knew all of the exits that I, and, and even when you were telling me I was wrong, I, would you forgive me? Everything changes. So when your children, even with you or whether it's with each other, when your children are in the process of correction and you're bringing them to the point where they need to seek forgiveness, literally, you want them to seek forgiveness. Sister, will you forgive me for what I did? Brother, mommy, will you forgive me for not obeying you? Use the biblical terms. Get that process going in your, in your family with your children. And one more thing here on this before we move on. Gentlemen, for man to man here, dad to dad. If we sin against our wife in front of our children, it is right, of course, to make the words, will you forgive me, darling, for whatever the sin may have been. But also... If it's done in front of our children, we are obligated. And mom, it's really, this, it goes both ways. We are obligated to turn to our children and say, children, will you forgive dad for not being a better example? That's, that's what brings a healing. That's what brings family identity. That's what brings real love into the family. You say, well, if I said that, my children are going to run all over me. No, if you said that, you are going to draw the heart of your children to you to be that vulnerable. Uh, it's not easy. I, I praise God that someone came into my life to share, you need to seek forgiveness of your children. And so Amy and Jenny, I'm to this day, I'm still, you know what, I, I look back, Amy, Jenny, I, uh, I, you know, I, I, the things I did wrong, would you forgive me again? She said, Dad, it's okay. You've been asking for forgiveness, it's okay. Don't be afraid to seek forgiveness from your children. They're not going to stop loving you. You're not going to lose your influence of authority. You, you, need to, you need to seek forgiveness. By the way, did I mention you need to attach confession? See, it can't be just, I'm sorry, and it can't simply be, well, all right, Deb, will you forgive me? Debbie, will you forgive me for losing control of my tongue? Add the confession. What is it that you are really repenting of? What is it that you're seeking forgiveness? Now, let's continue on. Let's talk about restitution. This, too, is added to the forgiveness. Restitution is, is one of those great biblical concepts that seems to be buried somewhere in the Old Testament that absolutely needs to be resurrected in our day, certainly among the Christian families. Restitution means to make things right. In the Judeo-Christian ethic 30 years ago, folks, if... If my child broke your cookie jar, we would not only buy you a new cookie jar, we would buy you one equal to, better than, and fill it up with cookies. That was a parental obligation. We did not ask you to check your insurance policy. Do you have a comprehensive on that? Could you cover that? We didn't do that. When, when we played baseball, never forget that, who, that Saturday morning when we played baseball with the kid next door, our, well, the whole neighborhood group of guys, but um, Dick was next door, and we, he hit the ball. And it, the ball smashed into a window of the trailer. Well, the trailer belonged to a state trooper. Fortunately, he was on the road. We were so, we thought he was going to lock us up. Now, when, when Dick's father uh, went and knocked on the door, he didn't have to knock on the door. The wife was there with the baseball. <laughs> but you know what he did? I'll never forget this. He fixed the window. He did not ask, who's your carrier? Uh, what kind of insurance do you have? Would you submit this claim? You see, it was understood. It is our responsibility. My child financially violated your property. My obligation is to make it right. Restitution is beautiful. Exodus 22 explains all of the restitution um, process. Whether you did something unintentionally, there's restitution, or whether you did it intentionally. In fact, restitution, I didn't mention this in our last uh, session, restitution is another corrective measure. Sometimes restitution is, you know, you told your child that he wasn't supposed to get that can of pop out of the refrigerator, but they still went and did it. Restitution would say, you know what, I'm not going to chastise you. I'm not going to uh, punish you. I'm not going to put you in your room, but I am going to require that you work to repay. Are you ready? For four drinks. Why four drinks? Well, because you remember Zacchaeus, Luke 19? 
because he sinned willfully in stealing money from the poor in the process of ga gathering taxes. And he said, and I will repay fourfold, which is according to the law of Moses. When you steal like that, you pay fourfold. That's another way of bringing correction to the child, restitution. The point is, you could have repentance. You could have forgiveness. You could have confession. You could have the emotional restoration. And it's still not fixed because there may be a financial obligation. Moms, dads, if your child breaks another child's toys, a neighbor's or a brother or sister, then help the child understand. The obligation is more than just simply saying, I'm sorry, I broke it, or will you forgive me for not being careful? But now we need to replace it. Why? Because it's morally right. The obligation on us is to restore to the condition it was at or even better. Finally, let's just real quick talk about uh, the issue associated with measuring repentance. How do you know if they are repentant? Well, there's a, a couple of things that will help us understand this. Uh, certainly, if a child cries, that is, uh, when, when they're confronted with sin, that is uh, noble, but that is not necessarily a sign of repentance. Certainly, if a child says, Daddy, I know that was wrong and offensive to you and mom and God in heaven. I promise I will never do it again. That is also not a measurement of true repentance. What does true repentance look like? Let's talk about it. A couple of tests of repentance. Number one on your outline. The most obvious test of true repentance is whether the child goes right back doing that for which he was just punished. All right? That's obvious. If he goes right back to it, He's probably not repentant. Or here's, a, here's another one. If the child maybe not goes right back to it, you just correct your child, but they go over and they kick the dog or they kick their brother or sister. That's another sign that you really didn't get to their heart. There was no real repentance. Now, why does this happen? Why would they go right back to that? Number one, parents forget to give the moral reason why. They forget to give the moral reason why. And that was, they got punished. But the child has no clue. So what was I punished for? They really don't know why. And number two, it could be because of a half-hearted spanking. This, this causes it. That what we did is we frustrated the child enough, we disturbed the child, but we never in our, in our discipline brought the child to full repentance. Another test of true repentance is this. It's the attitude. What kind of attitude does your child have? Again, is he walking around kicking the cat? Or does he have a desire to restore with you? That's a sign. That's a very positive sign. That's a, that's a measurement of true repentance. The child that wants to be in a right relationship with mom and dad. Listen, you got that little 18-month-old, and we just swatted that hand. We took something out. We said no. And the child, even in that, the development of that young conscience, realizes they were wrong. When that happens, and when that child puts his or her hands up to be held, that is your child telling you, I want to be restored with you. I want to be held by you. I want to be close to you. I need the security of your love. You take that child. You restore with that child. Older children will do this too, but in different ways. Sometimes it just shows up with, Mom, can I, can I sit and read with you? Or, Mom, can I, you're going for a walk. Can I go for a walk with you? They will also send you signals that they want to be in a right relationship with you. Look, let me just summarize this. We'll get Amory up here to do the wrap-up. What we've talked about in this particular session is the importance of the relational elements. We need to have repentance. We need to restore. We need to understand the biblical doctrine of forgiveness, that you seek forgiveness. It's a lot more than simply saying, I'm sorry. You now have been introduced to the concept of restitution. And sometimes in the life of your children, you're going to have to teach them the importance of laboring so that they could restore through the process of restitution. All of this is going to help a child become a morally responsible, biblically responsive young man or woman. Right now, why don't we stop, honey? Why don't we get ready to do the wrap-up, and we'll get ready to take your questions. Okay? Let's do that now. This is the best part of the teaching session. Be able to interact with you people, be able to answer your questions, and even more than that, now we have Anne Marie to bail me out. So honey, <laughs> uh, repentance, forgiveness, uh, restoration, restitution, confession, there is so much involved in this lesson. So let's get your thoughts. We have a scenario to look at again, and then we have all of their questions. There was. As a matter of fact, there was 
so much that you said that was jogging things in my mind. I had to write some of them down so I don't forget. Um, but you know, part of, like you were sharing too with the um, at forgiveness and, and the motives of the heart, that's sometimes a difficult thing for us as a parent. Obviously, we want to give our children the benefit of the doubt. And someone had shared a scripture with me, which I thought really applies quite well. In Proverbs 16, um, verse 2, it says, All the ways of a man are pure or innocent in his eyes, but the Lord weighs the motives. And mm -hmm. in, in our children, particularly when they're younger, we kind of have to stand instead, and it's, um, we have to seek God's wisdom, actually to be able to judge what are some of the motives. And some of that comes by their behavior, their characterization that we talked about. But that does all tie in because it's going to be difficult to bring them yeah. to repentance Absolutely. without them understanding that, no, you know, this wasn't just a mistake. Well, w without moral training, without a standard, without a moral direction, there is no way that you can define motive. That is, there's no way for a child to be able to define motive. That, again, is another reason why moral training, putting God's values in, which, which divine, uh, defines our character, that will help parents have an objective benchmark to, to measure motive. Great, mm -hmm. great verse. And the, um, the aspect, too, uh, of you sharing about, the, you know, our fellowship, that's what gets broken and the joy that is out of there. So for those of you particularly that have the little ones that, you know, we often get asked the question, my child's two and a half and I don't see a repentive heart there in him yet. Well, you're not, you know. They are still in the process of beginning to just even understand what a relationship is. They, don't, they still haven't come to a point of understanding a trusting relationship, how it impacts us. So uh, you had mentioned it, but again, as parents, um, we so much want to see these aspects developing in our children's character, but we can't rush the fruit. It's, it is going to be a process. Honey, let me ask you this. Uh, I mentioned that four or five years of age, they start moving towards repentance, but it's not four or five. It's a transition, right? Right. That you start seeing the gentleness and, and that little heart yearning for repentance. Mm -hmm. And with some children, it could come sooner, and others, you know, you may not see it until they maybe even are preteen. So there could be a child here, mm -hmm. very sensitive. I mean, this mm -hmm. is the child that, Mommy, I've done wrong, and I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against the Lord. And then you've got that last born child, that baby who just loves the world, and maybe or they, they love prohibitions. And, uh, and, and, and so you're going to work more with that child. So every child is different. They're not all going to come to true repentance and demonstrate that visually at the same age, at the same month, the same week, and the same day. Exactly right. And uh, another aspect, too, um, in talking about bringing our children to that issue of asking for forgiveness and the confession that belongs as a part of it, um, there again, that's going to vary from child to child, even within the same home. Um, sometimes it's very difficult for some children to take ownership of their wrong because their, their first reaction is, well, yeah, I did hit her, but that's because she took my toy. You know, there's always a justification for why they did what they did. And so it takes time to sit down and to work with that child to help them to take ownership. And I think uh, in the, the big scheme of things, you can see why it's called biblical discipline or biblical training because it's a process. It's going to take a long mm. time to get there. And uh, God usually gives us our children for a long time, so there's not a big rush to accomplish this. You, you had just mentioned it. Could you share with them how important is using biblical terminology? Oh, it's, it's very critical because that's what you want them to understand in the long run, and that's what's going to get to their heart because it's the Word of God that quickens their hearts. Um, so so forgiveness. You, for forgiveness, confession, um, repentance, all of those issues, wisdom when we talk about it, foolishness, foolishness all of those okay. terms. That was a foolish act, that was a wise act. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Mm -hmm. What else, son? Um, oh, one other thought <laughs> that I did have um, under the test for repentance, and especially if you have older children, uh, it might demonstrate itself as they turn around and you hear this mumbling that's going on underneath their breath. Or, um, it, and it might be a look. Or, you know, just maybe just a, mm -hmm. okay, I'm sorry. You know, or there's different things. It's, it's not going to even look the same, especially as they get older. So that's something else to look for. If you okay. hear that, okay. it might be, shall we try that again? Okay. You know? 
You know, one of the things that parents fall into, the trap that uh, it's so easy to fall into, is what we're going to see on our scenario that we saw at the top of the segment. Let's revisit that scenario. Let's all, uh, again, take a look at the scenario, and then let's you and I talk about it. Okay? Let's watch the scenario right, right now. Mom, I went to Billy's house. You went to Billy's house? Daniel, you know that's all the way at the end of the block. That's off limits for you. I'm sorry, Mom. Okay. All right, well, because you're sorry, I'm not going to punish you this time, okay? I'm going out and play. Oh, what, Daniel? I needed a pen, so I got it in your purse, Mom. My purse? Daniel, you know you're not supposed to get in my purse. But because you confessed, I'm not going to do anything about it this time, okay? Thanks, Mom. What is it, Daniel? I took a soda from the refrigerator and drank it. A soda? Daniel, you, you know you have to ask before you get in the refrigerator. I'm sorry, Mom. I won't ever do it again. Well, okay. Since you'll never do it again, then this time I won't punish you. I'll let it go. Thanks, Mom. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in that particular scenario, what we saw is a child that continually was going to mom before mom even had a clue what was going on. Now, a child that will commonly do that, the question that we're commonly asked is, well, what, what would we do as parents in that situation? And what we would suggest is this. Praise your child for their honesty in coming to mom, but punish for the offense. And the reason you would punish for the offense is because you do not rightly deal with sin by swapping it for a virtue. The fact that a child will continue to come to you, confess to you before they get caught, and if there's no consequences brought into their little life, they are going to continue to do that. They're going to continue to sin because if, if there's no consequences, why not? I have the best of both worlds. And this is where we really go back to even last week's lesson, I believe it was, with the dialogue question um, that you will ask an older child that will come with that repentance and, and offer confession of their sin in the hopes that maybe there mm. won't be any consequence, um, you want them to learn, all right, because as you said, you praise them for their honesty, but there still needs to be a consequence for their sin. So you ask the child, now, why is it the right thing that you told mommy right. the truth? But why do we also need to have a consequence? So all of these things are going to help them reach, it's going to reach their heart. So in time, they internalize I these believe values. If you remove the consequences, Upon the confession from the child, uh, the child's going to repent every time. But it will be false repentance. That's all it is. That's enough here. Let's take some questions from you folks. Uh, there's got to be plenty. So uh, we got the mic going here. Who would like to begin? Okay. Right here. We have one right. We'll start right here. This question has to do with restoration. And I'm wondering what are some effective ways in working with our seven year old daughter and nine year old son? in situations where they refuse to restore. So there's been like war between the two. Yes. Y you know, that's one thing the parents have to guard against. In, in our own hearts, we want that restoration so badly, we will turn and say, you know what? You two just need to hug. You two need to may just make up right now. And there are some neat little things you can do, like, OK, hug each other and don't let go until you're restored. And they'll restore real quick, probably, uh, if they don't kill each other first. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there were times when Amy and Jenny had their little squabbles and they weren't ready to restore. And so it was rather easy. It could be a, something as simple as you go to your room, sit on your bed, and you go to your room, sit on your bed, and I'll check back with you in a few minutes to see if you guys are ready to talk to each other. Uh, it could be something like that. What, what else can you do? Well, I would just follow through with that. And part of the, the reason why is we want our children to learn these skills young. I mean, what a hard time we all have sometimes of restoring mm -hmm. with our peers because we haven't learned this skill and it again it takes time so if having them each go to their room or maybe it might even be in the living room once it's on the couch once it's on a chair and they need to stop and think but say you know this is not over mm -hmm. until you two are restored because this bothers the fellowship in our whole home 
So right. letting them understand Restoration, that. understand, does not mean we are both at a point of absolute contentment and happiness. Mm -hmm. Restoration is not, is not a, a, uh, a condition in which both children have to be joyfully, blissfully in love with each other. Restoration means that there is a process, it's a biblical process, we need to do those things that are right, and then time will come when our hearts will be yielding one to another again. So understand that. I mean, if you're going to try to get your kids to be restored, and if you're looking for them both to be smiling and playing with each other right away, that may not happen, and that's okay. Each one then may need a little bit of time. In fact, when parents are, are working with a child to get let's say that you correct your child, you chastise your child. And sometimes we as moms and dads, we want that restoration right away. And so we say, honey, one, come here, mommy's going to hug you and everything's okay now. And you feel that little bit of tenseness, uh, tension. That's probably because the child, although the child's received his correction, the child's not ready to restore yet. He's got some maybe lingering things that he needs to deal with. That's when you put the child and say, you know what, honey, why don't you just take five minutes Sit on, the, sit on the couch, I'll be back in, and then you and I may be able to talk and, and uh, close, close this off and, and restore at that point. Don't be afraid to give the child five minutes to, to settle any of these lingering things, okay? Let's go back now, a question uh, back with uh, Dwayne. In the process of teaching your child repentance, um, how do you avoid um, entering into a power struggle, especially if the child doesn't really want to repent that is a good question because there, there are days when um, our children can be very stubborn, probably death have wish. good examples have sometimes. Wish. Yeah, that's true, death wishes. Um, but you don't want to get into a power struggle. And so you're, you've brought correction and you're not seeing any type of a change at all in their attitudes, their heart. Um, you may take a time to say, okay, do you need to reevaluate, do you need to bring correction one other time. But if you see that you're not getting anywhere, it might just be, you know what? This is a good lesson. You're saying this to yourself inside. This is a good lesson for me today to, to learn. And ask and really pray and ask the Lord to say, is there other things that I'm missing in the context of correction with this child or the child's heart um, that I need to see? Now, that doesn't mean you just say, OK, you know, you win, go play. You may have a time where, again, there might be some reflection that the child's going to sit and say, you know, this is enough for right now, but I want you to sit here for another five minutes, and then we'll let you get up. And basically, watch for the patterning. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kathy, I think you had a question. My question has to deal with restitution. Um, this is the scenario. My daughter... Um, had a necklace that broke by a friend and the friend said I'm sorry but it was an accident and she said okay then a couple of weeks later my daughter lost someone else's pants and I went through the process of helping her to, res to make restitution for those slacks and she felt very indignant about that thinking gee this is not fair how come no one has to uh, pay restitution for things that happened to me and uh, my thought was, well, this is, is this a time when she needs to learn how to cover over with her love and forgive? Or how does she go back and say, hey, pay for my necklace? <laughs> what do you yeah. do with situations like that? Well, there's a, really, there's a couple of things you're bringing up that are very important, Kathy. Number one, if you're going to live to the standard, there's going to be inequity. Not everyone's going to live to these values. Not everyone's going to live to the, the significance and the ethic of uh, restitution. Uh, the fact that uh, your daughter did not get a necklace replaced is unfortunate. But, Kathy, this is where you have to teach into it. This is where we bring in, you know what? Uh, not everyone understands these values that we hold, mommy and daddy hold, and that we're teaching you. Uh, what would have been right, honey? That the necklace would have been replaced. And realizing how much that may have troubled you, you know what? Mom and dad may consider doing something special this time and, and having that necklace replaced. But regarding that pair of pants, was it? Mm -hmm. Regarding the pair of pants, let me explain to you why you need to take care of it. Why, you, in our family, this is a value that we hold very dear, why we are responsible. Turn it into a teaching experience. But all of you remember, not everyone is going to be at these standards. Not everyone is going to be as fair, as honest. And Kathy, I know you guys have done it. You just teach your kids life isn't fair. And that, you know what, we're here to serve and play, to play for one. And that is the Lord as a family.
Honey, what, anything? Well, that was I was going to add that that whole issue again because I know obviously if she's old enough to borrow something from someone, um, she's definitely at a point to understand. Again, why are we doing it? It's not. It is our family that holds these standards, but it's based on the Word of God that we hold these standards. And so you're continually, especially in the middle mm -hmm. years, bringing them back to the Word. So that is what is going to be internalized again in their heart. Okay, where are we going now? Uh, I think Debbie has one. Debbie has one right here. What do you do with a child who seems too quick to want to seek restitution, almost as if they were um, trying to avoid any further correction? Well, and that, that does happen. Um, because our kids are all so smart, and they realize, okay, if I just get this over with, and then she won't lecture me anymore about this particular issue. And if you see, again, this is why understanding your child, their age, the characterization of this, if you're beginning to see a pattern develop, it's like, no, we are not quite finished with this young lady. Um, and I guess we've actually suggested several times, and having them sit down on the couch and wait. No, we need to talk about this a little bit more. And then one of two things will happen. The child will willingly sit and wait for you to come and talk about it, or they will really demonstrate what is in their heart. I mean, either way, it's demonstrating what's in their heart. The other way will be, but I don't want to sit down, and they'll start misbehaving. So then that does, that tells you too what's going on. And um, so I want to encourage you as parents, instead of getting visually upset with the child with that, which is usually our tendency to do because, because of that behavior, is just look at these things as uh, windows to their heart and just kind of say, thank you, Lord, that I'm seeing this, and, and view it that way. But then, so now you know what you need to deal with some more, but deal with it. You know, we spent a lot of time uh, in this wrap-up taking the question and answers, and I think we need to close it down here. But let me piggyback off of Debbie's question and just simply say, I hope you've noticed, parenting takes a lot of time. If you are going to be the architect of a human heart, and many of you have more than one ch child, if you're going to be the architect of many human hearts, moms, dads, it takes time. Thanks for joining us in this session. Uh, you guys got homework to do, uh, reading assignments to do, and join us back in our next session of Growing Kids God's Way.